There's over 50 here online, that's great. And kudos to those of you that managed throughout the whole day and are still in the office on a Friday night. Some of you might be over summited. So we had a lot of offsites and meetings. And I hope you enjoyed the day, uh, the day so far. Okay, so Ada Lovelace, who you see on the picture here, let me consider the first software programmer. And she imagined more than 100 years ago that computers uh, one day might write poems and compose music. So by now they're doing this. And I want to convince you that they will also soon write computer programs and this will change our profession forever. So um, I do a little bit of intro, so cash warm up, and then I'll say at the end, but the, my key points will be machine learning will write software. It will also be machine learning will re replace code, so there is no software as we know today. But then there will also be an interesting pattern where the programmer um, and the machine learning will work together. And uh, one direction I find particularly interesting is a differential computing. So I was inspired, or um, I was inspired by this in 2017 when I. Does it sound okay? Strange here, but you're good. Okay. So um, this is a, a 2017 talk by Peter Norvig, who is a professor at Stanford. He also was director of quality search at Google. Um, and in 2017, he um, did a talk as we may program. And this is a reference to one of the most famous papers maybe ever written in computer science, as we may think, which is a, a 1945 paper um, where the author like envisions hypertext Wikipedia in a time when computers were still optical devices. So um, like a connected brain that's interfacing with a machine. So and Peter Novig asked the question, not as we may think, but as we may program. And as this was five years ago, I thought now five years later, I liked the talk back then. And what had happened in the five years, is it still a trend? And uh, so I did some research for this talk to find out. Um, he's our, uh, Peter Novig is also an author. He wrote the most famous book um, on AI. So it's standard literature in most of classes worldwide. Um, and he also, and my most favorite book from him, happens to be a different one. It's our Programming Artificial Intelligence. Um, and in this you both learn Lisp, or rather closure maybe today, if you want to do the programming classes, and Symbolic AI, which is a craft that is out of vogue at the moment, but I think it will have a comeback. As I think functional programming is also having a comeback. So I, I want to walk you through three like philosophies that programming has been. So this is one of the first computers, um, the EDVAC. So there are great books to read about it. If you want to learn about the computer, then George Dyson's book is the one. If you want to learn about the people behind the computer, then there's a book by Walter Isaacson called Innovators. So this is one of the first computers. And my point here is if the first programmers were scientists. And because, um, I mean, running programs were so lengthy and rare, so maybe you would do it once a night. They would prove correctness from, of their programs just as they were from their science work used to proving that things are correct. And the computer you see here, the memory of the first rack in the front, that would be kind of um, the amount that a tweet is today. So you could save one tweet on this first rack here on the computer. And you also see here on the bottom the first rack, which was an act, actual enemy. I mean, they were so, so good at proving correctness that when they encountered an actual error, it happened to be a real bug that was in the computer. And um, well, that's how good their programs were. Okay, things changed. Um, there was a new generation of programmers. Programmers were doubling every year or so. So there was exponential growth. Would be young kids from college taking on. So um, how would you get this, you know, scientists like Nobel Prize winning characters that created those ideas we still build on today's like Alan Kay and, and others. Um, so how would you scale that to factory? And um, David Parnas would be one of the pioneers maybe here. So he was the one that came up with this um, modularization that became this uh, basic concept also for object orientation. But he also was a pioneer in like software testing, documentation, 
So the, we developed all these engineering practices that today gave us like CID, CD and um, high level programming languages, version control, profiling. So this is really, I mean, the idea is how do you scale it to the masses and democratize um, software engineering? So, and I would brand this as the age of programming is no longer science, it's becoming engineering. Okay, you want to scale it so everyone can do it in good quality. So I'd argue we entered a third stage, which is now the tooling is so efficient that we are not always engineering so well. We do a lot of hacking and test and try. So you can see there's still the computer input output. You put your pro program on it, making it a device uh, that with a specific task. And then, but I mean, you wouldn't prove correctness. You maybe don't follow all the engineering principles all the time, but maybe you just go to Stack Overflow and, and you try something and you try again and try again. And because iteration is so fast and tooling is so good, you always only know your program is probably right. Uh, you never know for sure. And it's, it's now similar to like natural science or observation. So you're experimenting all the time and you're observing it. And this is uh, different from like engineering a bridge where you wouldn't build a bridge and then see if it works. Um, and um, we have opened up computer uh, to see the world with sensors, um, but we still were writing like programs for them. So this is, um, this would be Kasparov, there's a great book about the former chess champion, how he got beaten by Deep, Deep Blue. And um, you would still, I mean, in the nights between the, the match days, the programmers would kind of iterate on the program. They would do their Stack Overflow thing and kind of patching the program. And uh, Kasparov until today holds a belief. Ah, now the animation doesn't work. So I wanted to show the bug here again, because actually um, in one of those night shifts, they introduced a bug um, to, do, to the Deep Blue software. It created a weak move which Kasparov found so surprising that he thought the machine is, is kind of so strong that he, um, that he changed his style and play. But what, it's what actually a, a software bug that made him lose. We have the bugs everywhere, right? You had the, the, the true bug at the beginning, you have many more when you, go to, when you scale it out and they're still there. Okay, and, um, so we opened up, I mean, we had opened up even for Deep Blue for machines to see the world, but we had the men in control or the women to, um, to do the program and create the device. And now with machine learning, of course, we still have the computer see the world, but now you see the human is almost removed. I mean, it wouldn't be fully removed. You have those people define the architecture, define objective functions and doing all kinds of things, but they're more in the background. And now you enable the computer to uh, improve itself. And so it would do things like, um, like in a Tesla with the eight cameras, seeing the environment, and um, and improve itself how it can learn okay to give a, um, to give a prompt like turn right to present or whatever. And we have also applied that if you compare what Alpha Zero did, which was a computer program that learned to play Go, a game that was considered much harder than chess, um, while the former chess program had chess champions helping on it and a database of in every chess game that was ever played and recorded. Um, now the self-improving machine, uh, there were not even uh, chess or Go experts on the team. And there also was no database. It was just self-play. So the machine would play itself. And after 40 days, um, it would be strong enough to uh, beat world champion. So it's the same. What I'm saying here is this empirical pattern we have today that we as humans basically just try and search based on stack overflow. I mean, if that what program has become, then a machine can probably do this better, right? Because we no longer kind of um, re reason with logic and prove and all those things that maybe the computers are hard on today. So I will come to some concrete use cases, how it looks in practice. I first want to um, stir your imagination a bit. So let's imagine, I mean, we're a little bit biased maybe on software engineers, right? I mean, this is our job, so forth. Let's uh, think about another profession like an architect. So how would you like an architect maybe to interact with a machine? And um, so it could be like this, right? On the left-hand side, you have like archetypes, some things like buildings are being built, there are different patterns maybe, 
how the layout on the ground is. And then you have, um, then from this primitives, you might want to create like composites that, that are different ways how, um, how buildings are built. So, and, and for a particular building, maybe there's a, a basic parameter, right? And then there might be different templates you want to apply. So maybe you want to say, okay, I want varieties because this will be residential buildings. You might also say, no, this will be a big office building. So I go for a layered template. So I want to have those um, more layers on top here because there will be shops down there and offices up. Um, after you've done it, you can say, okay, I apply another pattern or template, which is okay. Now I need a passageway in between. And then a machine, machine could suggest where that should be to minimize an average um, way lengths or a kind of uh, stability of the building or whatever. At the next step, you might want to say, okay, and maybe I bring down the ceiling on one side, I bring it up on the other side so people here can see the nature and people on the other side, I just have more space for my office and they, they are fine to be in the shadow anyway. And um, so what I'm saying is, I mean, it's kind of the machine is generating, I mean, the architect becomes like a teacher that's guiding the machine and providing feedback. And then eventually the machine might come up with several proposals and then the iteration doesn't stop. Then the architect might say, okay, I like proposal two and six. So throw away the other ones and give me more of those, more variations. Right, and this of course um, um, makes it to, to Pablo's earlier point and Nick's earlier point. Um, this is a way of de declarative, you could say, and it makes it more interesting. Okay, I come to practical applications, but I want to do a brief recap for those of you um, who are not into machine learning, that kind of um, what we have seen in the last years are really revolutionary. So, I mean, some of the basic ideas already came up in the 80s. It's the way how we train neural networks. And um, there's actually a summary paper by Grievenk um, that shows like how many times this idea was reinvented. So the first one who published was Rommelhart. Um, so the neural networks weren't big enough in the time, mainly because hardware wouldn't do it. Um, and so in the early, like 2000s, um, after the AI winter, um, there was, I mean, data was ubiquitous enough, compute would go up, and they had a few, one would say smallish ideas, how to improve the algorithms. So the main idea was already there. And um, then there was an explosion. I mean, then suddenly deep learning started to work. And there's a famous paper in Nature 2015 uh, by really three researchers that worked for decades in the field, kind of what deep learning has already achieved um, until 2015. And this was object recognition describing text generation, describing images, and a few other uh, breakthroughs. So um, for a brief time, there have been several. Well, always in the history of neural networks there had been many different architectures and they were competing for each other and they were very specialized. So unlike the human brain, for example, which is a general purpose um, reasoner. So um, there was a very surprising breakthrough. I think, I think even the author didn't realize it at the time. So these were several authors at Google Brain in 2017. They would uh, publish attention is all you need. And that was a new kind of deep learning algorithm. It's called transformer. And um, this has been an, an, a surprising and exciting uh, algorithm. And I think it's, um, at least I, and, and I think many other didn't see it coming. So it's, um, I mean, it has an architecture that's very different from other neural networks. And it's massively parallel. So if you give it an input, say all of Wikipedia or all texts of the internet, it would not just read it in sequence, it would go at the whole thing at once, uh, fully parallelizing. Yeah, so you have many different networks and they would um, work on the input in parallel. Um, you can, um, I mean, there's specialized hardware for it and there's coming new hardware out every, um, all the time. So that will, they will get mat, much faster even going forward. So it's long, no longer just GPUs, but I mean, it, Google has their own uh, hardware and so forth. And it's surprisingly general. Um, so, I mean, the most famous example is for text. So you have GPD-3, which is like basically an algorithm that read all text, read the whole internet. And it can make you believe you can chat. If I want to say I, I chat with Elon Musk, which probably I wouldn't like to do right now, but anyway, take someone. And I can prompt this with any environment. So imagine I'm in this century talking to this person, Napoleon, uh, after he won or lost some, some battle. I mean, the machine would 
um, would take this and I mean would assume this environment and would be a plausible dialogue with me, right? Um, so this is how it's trained because it's a massively parallel. You can you can train it on basically the world, and it has a billion of parameters. And it's general in two way, ways. It's general because um, it's multimodal, so it can work with uh, those text and images all at the same time. So you could connect such a machine to a real computer and interact with a computer, like moving the mouse and browsing and doing things on a computer. And there is a project that are doing this. It's also general in a way that since 2017, no one found a way to, uh, to improve it, which is like surprising at the first time in, in machine learning research really that people can't tweak the thing uh, giving it several years. And this is there's a massive uh, research happening on it. And it's generative. So that's example I just give, it can come up it can draw images, it can write poetry, it can do um, all the things that other lovelies uh, wanted to see. So we have it at Glovo. Um, it's in the, um, the future is already here, just maybe not distributed evenly, right? Um, so we have it in the size and weight predictor. And uh, we had it in the Hackathon project that was doing the image generation here. You can see nicely that it was a pre-trained mo pre model on like of world images, which you can download. Um, and it would create images that uh, look like images from other parts of the world, but not like global images. You can then retrain based with images from our app. And then on the same prompt, it would give you a much more realistic image. It sees how, um, yeah, how, how powerful it is as a tool. So in June, um, I mean, this language model is, um, is released um, by OpenAI, uh, which has a famous like uh, chief scientist. Um, so GitHub, for example, in June, they, they launched um, GitHub Copilot. I think that was available before, but maybe not in GA. Um, you can actually go to the website. So there are several examples, also how to write um, SQL or some regex expressions or create some uh, you know, Ruby objects. And um, I mean, it's not interactive here, it's a video on the site, but you can see, okay, you just give the header of the file. You say, okay, now I want for a string, I want to know if the text sentiment is positive and I want to use a web server. And um, then it will do natural language processing of this comment and it will, do, uh, it will give you the full method. And the key thing here, that is not templated scaffolding. I mean, you always had, of course, like you give and you prompt and you get some, uh, you get get some scaffold. I mean, this is learning from millions of programs. So this thing I've read, all of GitHub, right? And then you could retrain it on your old maybe company re company repos, and it will have learned and it will it will have a concept what a web service is. And uh, if you train it on a company repo, it would have a notion of how you do authorization for web services. It would learn those things. Um, so maybe, I mean, they, they choose and pick those examples, maybe not all examples work this nice, but um, I want to say it's, it's, it's learned and it's not, um, it's not handcrafted. But there are studies that look, I mean, of course you, I mean, you can do more than uh, source code generation. So in general, I mean, you can think about this, there's a paper from 2020, you can do source analysis, um, you can find, um, can do all kind of code fixing or, or um, security checks, profiling, whatever. And you, you can do uh, program generation and um, give you some um, concrete examples. So maybe, you, I mean, those are kind of pet examples, but I mean, things like this, I mean, those networks do today what we didn't, I mean, Go, the prediction was they would beat it in 20 years if, if they would ever beat it. So um, while this is a toy example, I think it's, it's not too far-fetched to think the machines to do this very well. First one is documentation. So the human writes a method, the machine gives the documentation. So less time doing documentation, that would be nice. Another one is UI generation. So the thing on the top is actually an image. You could have sketched it on paper even, um, and it will, it will create UI code. You could prompt it. Of course, you could also do it. I mean, you could say, give me a red button in the upper left corner and it would do the same. Um, you could program by example. So you just um, like a case-based example where you give the output pairs you want to see and, um, and the input, and then you, you have it, uh, you have the program fill the blank of the neural net. 
And there's another example like transpile. So you could say you write in one programming language, transpiles in another one. And also here, not as static handcrafted program, but it would just a bit like auto translate. I mean, if you've keep L or some other um, auto translator on the net, they can do any pair of languages. So they could do any pair of programming languages. So that was the first thing. Um, you remember I have three. The first one was the computer writing code. But now is a more extreme example because until I come to a more friendly one. The extreme example is there will be no code. Okay, so the computer is no longer helping you to do your job, it's doing the job for you. And um, this is what happened at big company like Tesla or Google. Um, so one example is computer vision. The task like in autonomous driving that you need to recognize the um, images. And I mean, this had been that has been done for decades. And here on the lower, um, at the bottom, you would see how a system in still in the 90s would do it. Um, and that would actually, I mean, you would craft feature extractors that would recognize edges and surfaces. And you would think about how does a traffic light might look like, and then you would say it's rectangular, it has three, um, it has three circles, and it has certain colors. Um, and um, this is, of course, how it doesn't work like this today. Um, so today, all this is done by a, a single deep learning network. And the same happened for translation at Google. So this is um, this is someone tweeted that from a presentation that uh, Jeff Dean did, who is a director at Google AI, also five years old. And he basically said on stage that with um, Google um, Translate, they replaced 5K lines of code. That's half a million with 500 lines. And the 500 line basically initializing the network and uh, giving it all the data. Yeah. So a network is a complex thing. Right, so, but, um, but so is a code base of half a million lines um, and the network would self-improve. So, and at Google, there was a big culture. I mean, they had a VP that was opposing that. This person left, there was a new one who embraced it. And, and then they went all in. And by now actually there is, I mean, they only publish, they don't publish everything, but they re are replacing a lot of even Google search, their core engine with machine learning and one paper they published uh, also out of Google Brain by Kaiser is one model to learn them all where they actually say that, that they have one, I mean, networks even solve different tasks uh, using this uh, multimodal uh, capacity. It's interesting that this pattern, I mean, reversing, I mean, usually uh, humans, we, we engineer by decomposition. You take a problem, you break it down, I mean, for every piece of software, you would have an, like a stack that shows you that breaks it into smaller pieces. The, cof the software we write, it's kind of, a, I mean, it's stacking like uh, little small snippets of program on top, to top of each other. I mean, we had it in the previous talk with the modularization. I mean, this is a totally different approach, right? It's undoing the decomposition and having this connectionist approach where it takes on the whole problem at once in a way that's no longer transparent for us, but that's super efficient. So this is uh, from a Tesla talk by Andre Capassi, who's an uh, AI director there. Um, and he described that, I mean, this expansion of, I mean, he described when they started, I mean, they always had machine learning in small places like, rocket, like object recognition. Right? The system I just described that can find a traffic light without you writing any code for it. Um, but they have those local deep learning systems and then they still put logic on top. And the example he, the example he gives in the talk is, okay, um, recognize a parked car, a car that's parked. And they started to write a program for it. So they said, okay, I mean, like recognize the, the car. They had a deep learning for this. Um, then of course they have, they have uh, they have image over time, they have videos. Um, they can see over time, does it move? Yes or no? And then you could write this rule and say, if it's no more than 20 pixels in the last three seconds, blah, 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 then it's, it's a standing car, not a driving one. And actually they figured out, um, I mean, just give them pictures of parked cars. You have, you have to figure out how you label them. But um, once you have these, the system 
um, will do it for you. And so the example he gives us, I mean, think of if you write a program yourself, he calls it software 1.0. You would in all the, in the complete space of programs, you can think of this is all the, I mean, there's an abstract space of all the programs you could write. And as a programmer, you come up with one project and it wouldn't be the most complex one because it needs to be maintainable. And um, so by prescribing a neural network with some architecture, uh, you're giving it a huge subset, I mean, a huge space of programs to explore, not all of them, um, but very many. And um, because of uh, the network can be trained, um, it can actually iterate the space. It will move the space and try different programs because of a, of a property of the network that I will describe in, in one of the next slides. It can actually, in an efficient way, find a program that's solving the task attempt. And the program it ends up with is most likely more complex. I mean, the language model has billions of parameters. And think of parameters, I mean, um, think of a program you have written, and then what could be a parameter? It could be initialization of a variable. If you think about what would be a parameter, if, if that was an actual program and not a, not a network architecture that was pre-wired. So that could be any initialization of a variable. That could be any um, primitive function of the computer language I use. I could exchange it. So for signers, I could make it a cosine or whatever. Um, that could be whenever I do an addition, I could be a minus instead. Um, so think of all the permutation you could do as a parameter, and then you have billions of those. And um, so the, I think the mental model here is that a machine learning, like a neural net, is not some specific algo in the ML toolbox, but think of it really as like a Turing machine. And I mean, it has been shown in various variations that it's a universal Turing machine, so it can do basically every interesting program you want to see. But I think that's, an, that's not an interesting property, but even the original Turing machine, like the one with the tape, the one-dimensional and the head on it, that could that could, was universal and could do any program, um, computer program. Well, so it's not interesting that it's universal, but it is interesting that it's trainable. I will talk about trainable. So last one on this one. So what um, Andre is saying for Tesla is that they started, I mean, what I alerted to before, they started and that's what he called 2.0 code. So um, the neural network a functionality that started to be a small part of the code base, and it's creeping up and becoming an ever bigger part. Okay, so if you think, before I come to this third and last pattern, how machine and human could, um, could collaborate, um, I want to look at the ups and downs or the, the pro and cons of, um, of this pattern of um, machine learning replacing uh, software. The first one of the apps uh, are, are the pros, the strengths, and then the last one more, a little bit more questionable. So what's um, first nice thing is that it's actually, I mean, networks are very complex as, um, I mean, as whole objects, but there's very few primitives. So it's matrix, multiplication, it's some um, uh, activation thresholding functions. So it's very easy primitives and it's very easy to bake them into silicon. So there, you have all this special purpose um, a chips coming up because it's so few primitives. If you, if you compare it with like a computer architecture with the CPUs, it's a much simpler computational model. It has fewer, I mean, which is surprising, it's fewer primitives and it's, it's less and, and still it's more expressive. Is that normal? Okay. Yeah, it's rain. But rain, that is 10 levels up, isn't it? Okay, I go ahead. Chief, I go ahead. Yeah. Okay. I have a time problem, right? Okay, I understand. But you don't have any appointments tonight, right? I mean, it's a cool topic. Come on. Maybe my talk isn't good, but, but, but the topic is cool. Okay, they have constant runtime and memory. So all the things that's plagued us as software engineers for decades, uh, a network doesn't have, I mean, it has a lot of memory, a lot of runtime, but it's constant. There is no, uh, there is no, cannot be any leak. It's self-improving. Right, so it's taking care of its complexity. And, and then you might wonder, do I need big data? So all the labeling of the parking cars and 
well, I mean, we don't have it as global, right? I mean, how would, would we label? And the answer you, I think is there, you already saw it in the, in the alpha go. And the answer is self play. I mean, you can have data, but you can also, instead you can pay and compute. So imagine, I think it's not, I mean, if you see what all those machines do, it wouldn't be hard to train a machine actually to be a global shopper, right? I mean, you can or shop in general. I mean, there's thousands of web shops. Um, you can give them a task, okay, place an order on one of these emulated shops and the network would learn it, right? I think that's not a hard task to learn. Um, and then of course, once you have this, you can have this self-play machine against machine. So if we have machines like that, that are part of the global code base, you can have machines that kind of place orders. So the system could self-play. I mean, that's not next year, right? It's not in the H1 objectives. So, but uh, if you think a few years ahead, I think that's not an outlandish idea. And it's actually easier and then some of the things that have been done, it's just uh, on this particular part, there have been no, maybe no research on it. Um, so data, labeled data um, is not the problem. I mean, there are other complexities, right? So it will be by no means easier. And I don't know if that takes, um, like two years or 20 to arrive, but I'm, I'm certain it will. But uh, you have explainability, how do you control the thing? How robust is it? I mean, it's probabilistic. So it's, um, it's, it's many concerned about most of the time, right? Um, um, security, I mean, so, you, so energy consumption, uh, so that is getting rapidly better. And then talent, uh, right at the moment, you have, you have data folks, data scientists, your software engineers, and, and often they're good in their craft, but not in the other. Um, so I really think even the roles will converge and maybe uh, one day there's no, no data competence model, no engineering competence model because the work has become so similar. And then we talked about factory practices. So all the things that make, make it scale. Um, so that's a tough one. I think for me, that's the toughest one. That's why I put its own bullet, why everything else is, is, is clustered because I think it's, it's, it's easy in comparison. So today we are proud we release maybe once, once a week or once a day. I mean, in, you, you don't patch a model like software. A model self, I mean, self, I mean, it can be retrained in milliseconds. We talk about release cycles in fractions of seconds. So we don't know how to do CI, CD for this. We don't know even if we don't ship a code base, but we ship a model, we don't know how we would, how we profile it. Um, so, I mean, it's just, we don't know how, I mean, just we haven't, totally haven't figured out how to get to the, in what we did for software 1.0, like getting it to the industrial level, we totally have no idea. And this is still the scientists work. So we are back to stage one. Um, in this new uh, in this new paradigm. I'm so already over time. It's good. That's the good stuff. Come on, five minutes. Something. Okay. Um, so, um, so the last pattern: differential uh, differential computing. So today, of course, we do. We have machine learning. We have it at global, but we take care that we fence it off. So we domestic silo. For example, if we predict a delivery time, we have an we have an API, it's behind an API or it's a component, it's modularized. Um, it gives us a prediction. The prediction might have some uncertainty, but then we make, I mean, we quickly remove the uncertainty. And um, so we might threshold it, we take the expectation, but even if the algorithm was uncertain what the delivery time is, I mean, we make some deterministic decision and then it becomes like a, a variable like everything else. So what if we, um, if we appreciate the uncertainty and let it propagate through our programs? And I, I would argue that changes, every, that changes a lot. So taking a deterministic statement today, so we take the log of the square of the sine of, um, of x, I mean, that's, that gives a, a predictable, that's the same number whenever you compute. But now let's think about a probabilistic computer statement. It's also one liner, but there's, it's, it's more complex. So we say um, there's some speech we got from a sensor. So we recognize it. Um, uh, we then want to parse it. I mean, we recognize the word, then you, we parse it into, uh, into like tokens and trees and, and everything that's NLP. And um, then at the end, maybe we want to translate it. So the idea here is, I mean, you wouldn't, there's a distribution of words. 
And the idea is that you don't throw away, I mean, you just not just keep the most favorite work, word, you keep them all with the probability. And you propagate those vectors to the machine because when you translate at the end, you want to know, oh, maybe that the machine, this step thought it's the most likely word. If I look at it in context, it isn't. And um, you have all those opportunities and then um, all those scenarios. And only in the end, you would say, okay, now give me the best, the best value given some, giving some loss function. And this, if you think about it, it's both, it's super powerful and super complex. Why is it complex? Because control flow changes. It's no longer, it's not clear. I mean, you keep all those vectors and matrices here and then only at the end you start to go back. It's a little bit like, you know, have you done your fully functional program where nothing evaluates, everything is lazy and at the end kind of um, it gets computed. Um, it's so big, of course, the space, you can, you can only approximate it. So maybe you have a Monte Carlo or a beam search or whatever. Um, but think about what you could do with it. Um, so you could say, think if you're all a software, if your complete software is, is this way and think about, for example, you put as a target, I want the performance, I think front end and back end, everything is probabilistic in this way. And then think about, I want put as a target function, I want performance of my front end to be better. And I mean, it has thousands of, and millions of programs thousands and millions of ways to run this program because you never decided for one pass. And then you say at the end, okay, and now I want to maximize performance or now I want to maximize profitability or now I want to maximize engagement. And the machinery could go back and, rat and rationalize and reason over all those scenarios and then pick the best one. So it's not clear how to do that efficiently, um, but you could one way you could just simulate, right? And then you could see there's 100, 100 ways to run the program or a million ways, and this is one that has best performance. And, um, and now think about if you have this, if there was an automated way to get this different, this property of differentiability um, for all your programs, how powerful it would be. The differentiability is a mathematical project, but so the intuition is if something is differentiable, you know, um, if I want to change the output by the program to make it a little bit more performant or more in, or increase user engagement, what do I need to change in the inputs? And the inputs could be any initialized variable in your program. Or it could be a lot of permutations of your statements. I mean, it could be your whole program, right? And um, if your program is differentiable, then you... It means you don't have to simulate kind of all the different passes, but you can use an optimizer like gradient descent to optimize the program for this specific uh, goal. And so the idea is, can you make a program differentiable? And then actually there's active research on it, very recent one, which is okay, there are ways to do it. Um, so you can transpile to like a vector-based language. You can actually, you can look at the parse tree of the program and go to the, and then you can use a chain rule and see, okay, if I know, how addition and minus and times and so forth, how this is differentiated, I can, I can propagate it to the tree. And there's some um, early tools. This is one from, also from Google, it's called JAX. And it will actually take the parse tree in a dynamic language. So this is, I mean, it's easy, it's relatively easy, it's a pure function and it's statically compiled. What they do even for a dynamically typed language, so for a Python program, they would, from the parse tree, they would, transpile it to some vector-based model and they use a library um, HLO so it can be many different target architecture. Maybe it's a TPU, so a TensorFlow, um, like a chip from Google. And then at the end, your, the program you wrote yourself is transpiled on a machine that becomes differentiable and you can run, optimize this like a neural network, except that it was your program, right? And it's at impressive speed ups. Um, I mean, it has some limitations, so you have to use some, prim you cannot use every primitive here, but for things that are not continuous, like ifs and else statement, I mean, they provide new primitives that kind of, um, and it will transpile. And I come to the last slide. Um, so this is futuristic. So uh, let's see what and when it comes. Um, what are the takeaways? Um, 
the first revolution you're already seeing in data. Um, I mean, that's a foresign what will happen to all of software. Um, there are different scenarios. So one is the first scenario I gave you is machine learning, machine learning assisted software development. So which means, I mean, you can consider developers today as micromanagers. Yeah, you see a um, the famous picture, uh, Margaret Hamilton, the Apollo code, which she helped write. Um, it's impressive, um, but it also, I mean, you have to be very obsessed with detail in a micromanager and it's error prone and it's painstakingly. And I have looked days on program and didn't find the mistake and Aaron, maybe you did too. So um, we'll turn developers from micromanagers to teachers that kind of work with machines like the architects which, when, they build, when they do their buildings. Um, some or even many code bases will be replaced, but then not all of them might be. So who knows as a new network is a, is a, as a new Turing machine is, is the last compute model we develop. So, and then there's coexistence of this differential programs where you have the both best of both worlds. We have transparency. You have a program you can reason about as human, and at the same time, it's differentiable in a way that the machine can optimize the program. And then I mentioned the challenges before, so I don't repeat them, that um, I think um, they're super interesting, exciting uh, engineering problems. And as machine learning systems are already super interesting from the engineering side today, um, they're very um, interesting engineering problems here to solve on this way. Okay, sorry for getting over time. Is there maybe one or two questions? Otherwise, I think we wrap it up for whatever comes next. I'm hungry. Yeah, I think we are late on time, so you can always talk to me after the talk. So thanks a lot. <laughs>